Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Question for you this morning to start things off. How many of you like to be manipulated? It's about how many hands I expected to see. Not a pleasant experience when someone manipulates us. A, a partner question to that first one. How many of you like to consider yourself a good manipulator? Put that one on your resume, huh? Or introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rob. I'm good at manipulating people. Manipulation, not a positive thing. So then I have to ask. When we read John chapter 14, verse 15, do these words sound just a little bit manipulative to any of you? You know they do to me. Jesus tells the disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, imagine anybody other than Jesus Christ saying those words, and I think you'll see my point. Imagine if your spouse tells you, if you love me, then you'll do this. Imagine if your mother-in-law told you, if you love me, then you'll do this. Or a friend, or a boss, or a teacher, or an elected official. If anybody other than Jesus spoke these words, we would say immediately, boy, that's manipulative. And so we really have two options here when Jesus speaks these words. I don't feel like I have to shy away from the fact that these words taken at face value are manipulative. So then we have two options. One, Jesus, and, and therefore by his church, Jesus, or by extension, Jesus' church, is manipulative, and that's a bad thing. This is the conclusion that some in our culture have come to. Now, if we can believe the surveys, the people who believe that Jesus and the church are manipulative, and that's a bad thing, are still statistically in the minority. But I'll tell you what, the people who believe that Jesus and the church are manipulative, and that's a bad thing, have a lot of positions of significant cultural weight and value. That's the first possible conclusion, that Jesus and his church are manipulative, and, and that's bad. But there's a second option, and it's the one that I'm actually going to cast my vote for. If I voted for the first one, that would be bad, too. The, section op the second option is this, that Jesus, by extension, Jesus' church, they're both manipulative, and that's a good thing. Now, how could that be? And if it's true, why would I talk about it publicly? Well, for starters, let's turn to our good old Merriam-Webster dictionary and see what does manipulate mean. Manipulate is defined by Daniel Webster, or some offspring of his, I suppose, to move or control something with your hands. All right, well, that in and of itself sounds sort of neutral. So now I want you to consider, you don't have to raise your hand for this part either, but how many of you have ever undergone surgery? You were manipulated, you know. How many of you have ever undergone physical therapy? How many of you have ever had a massage? A head rub? A back rub? A hug? Somebody held your hand? Somebody shook your hand? Somebody gave your hand a high five or a fist bump? Then you've been manipulated. And hopefully, if those people did their job well, being manipulated was a good thing. When a surgeon manipulates a patient, when a physical therapist manipulates a patient, when a masseuse manipulates a client, those are good things. Not always pleasant, but good. And as you go down through that list, you've probably manipulated other people. And it's been a good thing. Now, why talk about that here? Why broaden the definition of manipulation? Here. Well, because we agreed at the outset, Jesus' statement seems awfully manipulative. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. But the statement doesn't stop there. Our reading put a period there, but I would argue that shouldn't even be there. I think the full statement is this. If you love me, two things are going to happen. One, you will keep my commandments. But two, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of Truth. You see, here's the amazing thing that we celebrate every single Sunday. That Jesus was himself God in the flesh. That he himself was a hands-on God. He laid his hands on the sick. He laid his hands on the dying. He laid his hands on the lost and on the hurting. 
He was the master manipulator, moving and controlling things with his hands. Not the predatory sort of manipulator, more like physical therapy. The kind of physical touch that isn't always pleasant, but is very good. Even if it hurts sometimes, it always serves to heal. And that's what we needed. It's what we still need, because when we admit it, we're all broken in some way. We don't just need physical therapy, we need spiritual therapy. Sin entered this world, sin entered our own lives. And if we're not manipulated by God himself, then atrophy and decay and death will be the only possible result. So, Jesus came, our hands on God. He laid his hands on us, and then he spread his hands out, and those hands bore the nails for us. Then he even let Thomas put his hands where the nails had been in Jesus' hands. He manipulated all of humanity. He touched us with his hands. He moved us. He healed us. All who call on Jesus by faith are now saved because he's a hands-on God, a manipulator in the good way. And now, in this passage, he gets even more hands-on because he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. In fact, our passage said, I didn't put it on my notes here, but it said right there, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Can't get much more hands-on than that. God himself lives right inside of us. And so now we can start to see the point that Jesus is making. Love and obedience, those go hand in hand. They can't be separated. If we love Jesus, then we will obey him. It's not a given that people will love Jesus. This we know full well. There are many people who choose to reject his grace and his truth. But for those who do love Jesus, those who've been called according to his purpose, obedience is not optional. If you love Jesus, then you will keep his commandments. But there's a problem. I can't. I keep trying. I keep failing. I believe that I love Jesus, but it hasn't resulted in perfect obedience yet. I can even start to doubt whether I really do love him or whether I really love him enough. And that's where this hands-on God, this manipulator, comes into play. You see, love for Christ and obedience to Christ are inseparably linked. Because if you love Christ, then God the Father will send Christ's Spirit into you. Jesus himself will ask God for this. Jesus isn't saying, if you love me, then I'm really, really hoping you're going to obey my commandments. He promises, if you love me, then you will obey my commandments. And how does he know that? Because his own spirit will enter into our own bodies. That's how hands-on God is. It's not some sort of threat or coercion here. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Instead, it's a beautiful promise. God himself is going to put his own fingerprints right on your very heart, right on your very soul. The very same places that were stained by sin, he cleanses with his own hands. The very same places that were broken, he heals. The very same joints that had stiffened, he loosens. And even more than that, Jesus then promises to return and to unite us unto himself. We read, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And so you see why love and obedience and Christ's presence through his Spirit are so inseparable. You see why not only is Christ a manipulator, but we as his church then become manipulators. Christ used his hands here on earth to do signs and wonders, to show his love and his grace, to bring his truth and light and joy, and now we are those hands, because his spirit lives in us and we have been joined to him. It was his spirit who was present in your baptism, 
who caused you to be reborn with Christ into new life. It's His Spirit who delivers Christ's word of forgiveness every time we confess our sins. It's His Spirit that transforms bread and wine into a means of grace by which we receive Jesus' own body and blood. And it's His Spirit that speaks to us every time that we read His word and every time that we gather together. It's His Spirit now that lives in you and that works through you in hands-on, meaningful ways, because he has manipulated you, you now become a manipulator, in the good way, of all those around you. In the church, we learn the needs of those who are around us, and we use these hands, which are now, in a very powerful way, Christ's hands, to touch lives in meaningful ways with his truth and his grace, because that's what Christ's spirit does. And in our communities, your homes, your neighborhoods, your workplaces, your schools, wherever you go, the needs of the people around you are many. And you touch their lives then with these own hands in meaningful ways because that's what Christ's Spirit does. Thanks be to God, we have been loved by a hands-on God, and our life is now intertwined with His, and His Spirit is now alive within us. So now, because of Christ, we do keep His commandments, because His Spirit lives within us. He lives within our world through us. We're a hands-on kind of people. Love, obedience, promise, Christ's presence, they're all inseparably linked, not in some burdensome or difficult way, but in a beautiful, endless manifestation of God's love, as God continues to manipulate this world around us to bring His grace and truth. As Jesus said in verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them, he or she, no gender point here, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Our hands on God loved us, and so we love him. And because we love him, we keep his commandments, and by doing so, we love others. And because we keep his commandments and love others, he pours out his love even more upon us, and so this loop continues endlessly until his love is made perfectly known to all who would call upon him by faith. We, you and I, we've been manipulated by Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. And through Jesus Christ, we, you and I, have become manipulators of all who surround us. And that is a good thing, too. And so may our prayer be that God will continue to manipulate us, lay his hands on us, and change us by his Spirit, so that through us, his hands might continue to do their work to all who are in need. May the peace of God that passes understanding guard our hearts and minds firmly in this faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.